Hi and welcome to the Shiny New Object podcast. This is a podcast that looks at new marketing technology, what it is, how it works, and some expert opinion on that topic. Uh, and I am very lucky today to be joined by uh, two guys representing different parts of advertising history. Can I say that? Is that fair? Um, two people I've enjoyed working with, spending time with, talking with, drinking with, uh, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Patrick Collister, and when you talk about history, I've got quite a lot of it, unfortunately. I've worked out, I've been in advertising 40 years. Well, I'm, I'm Susan McGuigan from Leicester. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm Dave Burse. Um, I used to be in advertising, I was in advertising for about 20 years. Um, and then I, I quit about eight years ago, and um, I, I, I quit, but I, peeled, I seem to be attached to the industry by a bungee cord, keep coming back again and again, um, but at the moment I'm writing a book, um, another book, I just uh, released one about six weeks ago, writing another one, and I don't know why I keep doing it, because it's a nightmare. And you tell us anything nightmare. about the book? The book is about 200 pages. Right, yeah. okay, well, yeah. that's, that's a scintillating <laughs> well, let description. Me, let me tell you about my book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote a book, my book came out mm, 10 months ago, called How to Use Innovation and Creativity in Business. And actually, I'm really chuffed that it's had uh, 11 Amazon five-star reviews, and only one of them by someone I know. So Fantastic. 10, well done. 10 people have read it, and... Um, one, one person did say to me, a friend of mine said uh, he'd, re- he'd read my book and he sounded rather surprised. He said, I enjoyed it. What did you like most about it? I asked. He said, it was short. <laughs> there we go. I, I've got um, 20% of the way through your book and I put it down intentionally because the book that I'm writing at the moment is about creativity and innovation and I don't want to be over-influenced because there was stuff in it that, oh man, I want to pinch that. So it's like, <laughs> I had to put your book down well, that is flattering. Un- until after I've finished writing my book. Um, because otherwise, you know, it'd be. I'd otherwise, your book a wouldn't be a better book. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I just, I just changed the spelling mistakes in your one. <laughs> put so it back out again. How many books have you done now? Um, about five. Um, but a couple of them have been like private commissions. Um, I did one that was a. Uh, I co-authored a book that came out about six weeks ago with a friend called Sun Yu. Uh, Sun was head of innovation for Vanity Fair Corporation, who are the holding company for Napa Piri, the North Face, Timberland, Vans, you know, about 20 big fashion brands. Um, And he'd done some research with uh, BMW, and we took that research and turned it into a methodology, which is how to use innovation not as this high-risk, high-cost disruption of thing that everyone's been talking about for years, but actually to go, well, here's how the long-term innovative companies actually use it to grow their brand and to grow their products over time and to cement it in the hearts of their audience because everyone else is trying to do this disruptive leap and it's bullshit. So I, I, don't, I believe that that's the reason why 94% of CEOs are dissatisfied with innovation is because they're trying to do these leaps that mean that everyone has to unlearn that to relearn this and huge risk massive cost why would you do that so that that's not my approach and um, remind me of the title of that because I can put it in the it's, show it's an uh, iconic advantage iconic advantage you can uh, you can find it on uh, on Amazon we were uh, we, we somehow made it to be a bestseller the week before it was launched I don't know how that works but we're <laughs> Bestseller flag went up. It's like, huh? We're not even launched. <laughs> and Patrick, for the listeners, if they want to get, if they want to be the twelfth uh, reviewer, uh, <laughs> it's available on Amazon. I'm not sure how I feel about this. The book is only six pound ninety nine at cover price, and already the bastards have discounted it. You can get it for under four quid. Half of me says this is marvellous, liberating knowledge, and the other half goes fucking cheapskates. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> and what's it called? Remind me. Uh, it's got a scintillating title that could probably do with a bit of it itself. It's called How to Use Innovation and Creativity in Business. I also right. published Directory magazine, www.directnewideas.com. 
if people are remotely interested in innovations in communications, we'll that's come, what we do. We with. will come back at the end for the best way to get in touch with you. So no, no, more, uh, no more display ads within this, uh, within this podcast, please. I interrupt yeah. this podcast for a small announcement. Yeah. I'm thinking of selling my bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's interested. I've got, a, I've got a very good wife, actually, if anyone wants you know. I don't know where this is going, Patrick. I'm no, feeling no, no, uncomfortable. No, no. <laughs> so, as is customary on this podcast, I'm going to start with a couple of short questions so that listeners can get to know you a little bit better before we dive into the shiny new object of the week. Um, so, Patrick, other than your own book, what is the one marketing book you recommend the most often or have bought for people on a regular basis? Well, call me weird, but actually I read books. And uh, I know a lot of people don't these days. They uh, download PDFs. But um, I do read a lot of books. At the moment, I suppose I've got about three on the go. Uh, I'm reading Nicole Yershon's uh, Rough Diamond, which is uh, the story of how she tried to change the big culture of a big agency. And eventually they, um, they got rid of her. Um, I guess there are several one influential books, Brand Bubble, uh, when um, a couple of really clever uh, planners in New York took a look at the stock exchange and then looked at um, the statistics of uh, depreciating brand values while stock values are increasing. So there's mm. a potential uh, catastrophe about to happen there. Uh, probably the best marketing book, uh, was Mark Sherrington's Mark Sherrington's Added Value. Uh, he managed to actually start a marketing consultancy called the Added Value Company uh, out of that, but it was a fantastic book. Um, it's about, about 10 years old. What was, what was in that that kind of you responded to? So, Well, an awful lot of marketing is these days is uh, science. It's driven by data, and it's mm. actually incredibly difficult to wrap your brain around unless you're an econometrist. And what Mark Sherrington did was make the art side of, the art, uh, of um, marketing uh, understandable and he gave clear direction as to how you can achieve success, but without it being mumbo-jumbo. Um, really, really good book. And how about you, Dave, other than your own books? <laughs> um, you know, I... I love uh, one of my favourite books. I must have bought it five or six times and given it away or had it pinched out agencies. A Smile in the Mind. I just absolutely love that book. It's, it's design, really, but it's a bit conceptual design. It's really gorgeous. And who wrote um, um, I can't remember, but it's... it's uh, and that's about design specifically? It's, it's, yeah. And, and then there's, uh, for copywriting... Remember Alistair Crompton's book, The Craft of Copywriting? It used to be around oh. all the agencies. No, there was um, Luke Sullivan's book, Hey oh, Whipple, hey Squeeze Whipple. This. Yes, yes. Um, Absolutely phenomenal. I, I love the, one of the chapters in that is called Pecked to Death by Ducks. And it describes what happens uh, very often when you have an idea and as soon as you put it in front of clients, they start making little changes. And the whole idea is that, you know, one peck from a duck won't do you any damage. But when you get pecked a thousand times by ducks, those little what seem like innocuous changes, it can kill everything. And uh, I just love this concept, being pecked to death by ducks, because, you know, we've been there. Yeah. <laughs> we've all so, been there. So it's interesting for you both to, to mention, oh, does that, do you remember seeing this book around the agency? Patrick, was that something, looking back, that there was a kind of library? Because my uh, short experience in this industry, there's always, like, fancy sounding books on the shelves no one ever I've never seen anyone look at them pick them up or let alone read them is, is that is that a new thing or did people always used to have a kind of no there used to be a library, library of books no there really was and actually fascinatingly a guy called Steve Harrison uh, after he got his PhD in history the only job he could get was as the librarian at uh, Ogilvy and Mather mm. and it was while he was the librarian looking after the books he began to find out about copy and then bit by bit he ended up as a copywriter and then um, founded his own agency that he sold to WPP for a very a great sum of money. But, um, yeah, those were the days agencies did have libraries. Mm -hmm. So, moving on slightly, 
What is the most useful thing that you've bought with your own money, Dave, that you've used for work? So not something that the company or the publisher or whoever that's given you, but something you've bought with your own cash that's been super useful at work. This will sound ridiculous, but a jacket. A jacket? Yeah. <laughs> so um, you don't get cold? Yeah. Right. <laughs> I come from Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so for, for years, I was just the typical scruffy creative with the, oh, here I am, I'm, I'm actually the, right now, you know, get the converse, get the jeans on, get the t-shirt. Um, now, one of the things that I would find, actually, is that when you walk into a client's offices, and I would walk in, very often I'd be the scruffy guy with a leather jacket, and they look at you, you're out of place, and you don't get the respect. And the one thing is that a decent suit jacket was enough to make people feel as if, okay, you're, you're, you're one of us. You're, you're enough, you're relating to us enough to be respected. And I, didn't, I for years did not understand that, the importance of a little bit of smartness, a little bit of wearing the uniform so that people can go, you're one of well, us, you're not an thing. alien. <clears throat> when I was the uh, executive creative director of Ogilvy, my chairman sent me off to a style consultant and uh, basically, she told me I should be wearing uh, suits, bottle green. She wanted me to wear bottle green suits. And uh, she took me to a, a shop and tried to get me to buy an Armani suit for nearly a thousand quid. And um, I declined to do all of this because I happened to be the way I am. But it was really interesting. It got me to think that the way people perceive you is really important. So when people came to a big agency like Ogilvy, the creative director, well, there's a frisson of excitement. And I used to wander in looking like the geography teacher. And so if that worried other people, then suddenly I thought, what's the judo throw? How do I turn being a geography teacher into my shtick, if you like? And so I began to uh, use new business pitches as opportunities to run training seminars for clients. So I mean, I'd, I'd use um, um, flip charts and, uh, and try and explain how things worked. And so that's sort of my moment mm. as well, when I thought, OK, be true to yourself, but on the other hand, be aware of your audience too. Yeah. So my uh, slight experience of that is, when I was relatively new to the industry, I thought, yeah, I'll get a suit jacket, look the part, and wear jeans and, and brogues. Um, certainly in the new business role that I was in. But then I, I did a conference where there was a panel of four middle-class white blokes all wearing exactly <laughs> the same thing. And I, and from that point <coughs> onwards, I was just like, I can't. You know, I, I think the opposite is also true. Right? Yeah. At some point, if you don't dress and look a bit different, then people aren't going to even think you're capable of it. My friend Lazar Zamek uh, has just returned to Serbia uh, and he's now professor of marketing at the university there. Yeah. And his very first day, his very first class, he turned up in board shorts, Hawaiian shirt, and flip flops, and of course, scandalizing uh, the rest of the academic staff. But he said, Hey, I used to work at Google. It's really important that people know that my course is going to be cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, looking at other areas of your career, what have been your biggest work failures that have consequently set you up for success? What are those classic gaffes or projects that have gone horribly wrong that you look back on and think, I'm so glad that that was a disaster because that means I am now doing the thing that I'm doing? Well, um, I, uh, I've been the creative director of a top ad agency. We were number two at the time. I was the creative director of a leading direct marketing agency. I think we were either one or two at the time. And then I went to Google and so I worked in digital. And the reason for all of those is because I kept getting fired. And so <laughs> when you get sacked for one reason or another, what you do is you take a look at what's in front of you. So some people think that I've managed to reinvent myself, and actually I haven't. I've, it's been force majeure. So in many ways I'm incredibly grateful uh, for all of that to happen, because otherwise, you know, if I'd stayed at Ogilvy, I'd still be doing TV ads and uh, maybe a 
bit of kind of viral video man or whatever. Instead of which, I've been forced to learn uh, about how communication really works. So get, mm. can you get specific about that? I mean, I, I get that at a, at a higher level, but can you talk about why you got sacked from one agency and when you looked at everything in front of you? Now, what was your thought process? Mm-hmm. Just put yourself in the mind of someone who might be in, in this position. Yeah, I was pretty... I got... Uh, I suppose I wasn't sacked from Ogilvy, but um, uh, I ran out of room there. I was the vice chairman, and I got a new chairman, and we both regarded each other with incomprehension. He thought that the creative director of a big agency like that was like their star performer, because he came from a really small agency. And he was amazed that I spent as much time as I did with clients. But actually, that was my job, to explain creativity to clients Mm. and to uh, nurture creative ideas with them so that they didn't feel hostile to them, they felt part of the process. So I got a new chairman in, and he simply wanted to reinvent the wheel in his own way. And um, uh, I also thought that he was a numpty, And, by the way, he got walked off the premises two years later, uh, which doesn't often happen to chairman. And you said that that made you incredibly angry. I understand that. But how did you then turn that anger into, like, positive action? How did you you turn that situation around? I started a business almost immediately. Uh, I started two, in fact. And um, so the first business I started was probably the first ever crowdsourcing creative uh, website. I started that in 2000 called Creative Matters and the promise was a 100 hour turnaround of creative work by uh, freelancers, every one of whom had a gold from Cannes. And interestingly, I mean it was very successful pretty quickly. People weren't interested in the rapid turnaround. What they were interested in was help from people who were really good at it. Um, and the second thing uh, I started doing was uh, Training. I set up a training company, and uh, and that's more or less continued actually over the last eighteen years. I still train people to think, do stuff. And how about you, Dave? Does that sound familiar? Or yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I think I've uh, I've learned from Patrick, and I I have I've quit before I've been fired a lot of the time before I get discovered. But yeah, it, it's having the. I think I, I find it very difficult when people say, "What's your career?" Because I can't even say my career is advertising. I've done so many things. You know, I've, I've directed TV shows. I've, I've written music for film. I've do, you know, I've, I've done so many different things, and it's. I just love the exploration and the journey with everything. Um, I, I. I I can look back and, and there's a lens that you can apply to my career and say that I've failed at a whole string of things. Or there's the lens that you can go as actually what I've done is I'm just so restless and curious that I just have to keep moving. But get specific. Well, give me a time when you balls it up and you thought, oh man, and then you went through that transformation. Well, I, one of my first jobs in, in advertising, um, I, like Patrick, I, I, I got someone into the company, I was, uh, I got in a, an art director to work with me and I'd just recently become a copywriter. I'd been an art director, I became a copywriter. And um, so I got an art director and this guy had picked up a DNA D recently and I was up in Scotland. This is quite a glamorous thing, uh, up in Scotland, having somebody who just picks up a DNA D. So um, started working with this guy and within the first two hours I knew I'd made a mistake. As what he did he was, do? saying no to everything I was coming up with. And not just saying no, he actually was um, putting me down and saying, that's a terrible idea. Come on, think of something better than that. Think of something. And, and, and what happened was that after two weeks, what you, your brain adjusts to this. And, and when you're getting that amount of negative feedback, your brain goes, no, I'm not going to go through that pain anymore. And it shut down. I couldn't come up with any ideas. Two months later, I get fired because I wasn't doing my job. Um, and I thought that was it. I can't. I can't do this anymore. I. I my, my brain doesn't work anymore. I can't come up with ideas. And I. I get fired on the Friday morning, and uh, I packed up my boxes and took them downstairs to reception. And uh, I, I made phone calls and I, I got this, uh, an appointment with a creative director, um, in the afternoon. And I went to see this creative director in the afternoon, and. 
he looked through my portfolio and was like, yeah, really nice stuff in there, great. Um, do you have a couple of hours? He's like, yeah, sure. I said, I just want to give you a little test. I've got a couple of briefs here. I want to give you an hour to work on those two briefs. And I did. I, I worked on it, and I, and I, I absolutely went for it. At the end of the hour, on each of those briefs, I'd come up with a whole bunch of scamps of ads, but I'd actually then, because I can art direct and I can copyright, I had scamped up the best ad for each of them, and I'd written the full copy for each of them. And I handed him these things, and he's just like, I love the idea, but ideas, but I cannot believe you've taken it to this level. When can you start? Can you start on Monday? And I started the following Monday, two and a half times, earning two and a half times what I was earning at the job I'd just been fired at. And so, so interesting, um, there was a key point in that story where you said that you take so much external criticism yeah. that it disrupted your creative process. Yeah. And like, I'm very familiar with that with when you've been when you're in a band and I think mm. there's a there's a kind of a, a mindset for creativity I think you've got to be confident and comfortable mm. for, it, for it to kick off so it is interesting that you lost faith and then but you have the confidence and the goal just to throw yourself back into it so Patrick what how do you get out of a, a creative rut apart from the heroin <laughs> Um, it's really interesting uh, I don't know is the answer either because I've stayed in the rut <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's been quite cosy I mean I, I'm really fascinated by articles about where people work best and where people yeah. get their ideas best because actually I sit down at a desk and when I sit down at the desk, whatever's in front of me, I start thinking about it. So mm -hmm. every morning, I, I have an hour at seven trying to write the novel. Boom. Uh, and um, as um, uh, Stephen King said, if you're going to be a writer, you have to write. So I'm forcing myself to write. When it comes mm -hmm. to... And what's, other, your, what's your regimen for that? So you start, so you get up at breakfast at half six and then... No, I get up at seven and I'm at my typewriter first at thing. seven thirty. I try and write from seven thirty till nine. If Julie's in the office, uh, she comes in too damned early, and so that disrupts that. I tell you what, though, if you're looking about real discipline, I mean, uh, Peter Souter, when he was running uh, Abbott Mead Vickers as creative director, also wanted to write for TV. He was getting up at four thirty every morning uh, to put in two hours, two and a half hours mm. before going to do a full day's work. Wow. I mean, honestly, I find that so both I've, inspiring mm, and Great amazing. story. And for, it sounds very Hollywood, but I'm suspicious how long you can keep that up for. Because if you go get up at half four, what time have you got to go to bed? Well, Peter, to to bed like... it, what Peter did say to me is really interesting. He said, um, uh, he said, I'm very lucky because I've never drunk alcohol. Yeah. There's a lesson for us. There is, I think. I mean, Napoleon once said, a man needs six hours sleep a night, a woman seven, a cretin eight. And <laughs> that, I'm afraid I'm probably a cretin. So yeah. that's, a, that's a great I'm little sound bite. So um, <laughs> if you had a massive £10 million media budget to project any message on digital channels, you could take over whatever, buy all the banners you want, all the Facebook ads you wanted. You could put any message out there, it could be a word of advice. Does it have to be a message? No. Because it would be a message. I'd like to create a digital wall all along the Mexican border to show how pointless spending that money would be and how ridiculous, because of course you'd be able to walk straight through it. And what would you put? What would be on the on the digital? I, don't know, I just want to be a I'd political like you statement. Create, you'd create some digital out of home. I'd like to create a digital air. wall. Yeah, exactly. In other words, it's chimerical. It's a hologram. It's ridiculous. The whole concept is insane. Actually, that's, that's, a, that's uh, a really bad idea. I've suddenly <laughs> thought about. It. I mean, I'm just thinking, wouldn't it be great to build this digital wall just so that then everyone would know how fucking mad Trump is to want to buy a real to build a real one. On that wall, you could have. A video of what was behind the wall, so it just <laughs> no, that's brilliant. You're absolutely right because on that digital wall, what you could do is you could post uh, anything you want actually about the ridiculousness of walls, generally. 
How about you, Dave? 10 million quid. Mm. Uh, it would be a public service campaign, um, which is just to get people to start using their minds. Because I think that most people in their lives, I mean, we know that uh, through um, all the sort of Amos Tversky kind of work is that 80% of people's thinking is uh, is on autopilot, twenty percent is actual um, conscious thought, and the sort of that's the sort of Kahneman thinking fast and slow stuff. And I think that in business, businesses are set up in such a way that they discourage thought, and I think that that's a really really sad thing. Give me an example of that. Well, the whole thing is that the businesses are about norms, about conforming to a norm. Here's the way that we do things around here. Uh, this is our systems, this is our process, this is the assumed knowledge that we have, this is our culture, this is what it takes to be a whatever kind of person. And what that does is it limits people. And, and people don't want to come up with an original idea. They don't want to come up with something that breaks that. So any thinking that they do is, is within this very autopilot norm of a, an organisation. And I think that's a really sad way to live. I, I think that um, people go through life on, on autopilot and they fail to see the, the, the beauty and the things that are around us, the, the little weeds in the, in the gutter. And, and I, I, th I would just like people to start trying to have original thought rather than conforming to what everyone else is saying. So I think that's a, a lovely idea and a great use of a £10 million budget. Uh, so if someone's listening to this podcast and they're thinking, my God, he's right, I really believe in what they say, how do you do that? I know it might be obvious to three of us as creative people, <coughs> different guises. How, how would someone who's just seen the light from hearing that statement, what are, the, what are the kind of three simple things you could practically do to think differently in the way that you describe Build a digital wall. <laughs> <laughs> so allow anyone to have, <laughs> no, no. have a, a <laughs> digital <laughs> graffiti. <laughs> I, I think that, that so there are a certain number of things that you can do um, to, to try and do that. I, I think, first of all, you need to start consuming stuff that's out with your own norm. Because one of the things that happens over life is, is that our, I, I guess the term for it might be comfort zone, whatever it is, our... our our comfort zone, our norms, our, our, our understandings of life, they get smaller over time until you end up being a bitter old racist in an old folks' home in the South Coast. Um, I, I don't know. If you're listening to this and you're a bitter old racist <laughs> in the South Coast, I apologise. Um, but but um, the only way to, to stop that from happening, from ending up at the end of your life being the smallest, narrowest-mindedest person you've ever been uh, throughout your whole existence, the only way to do that is, is to to keep pushing the edges of your boundary, keep doing things that are new, keep giving yourself experiences, keep learning new skills. And if you do that, you end up the biggest person at the end of your day, not the smallest person. And that's one thing that I think is really important. Um, another thing is to, um, is to surround yourself by people who inspire you. And I, I think that very often people will end up, if, they, if you hang around with a bunch of people who have got no ambition, no interest in life, they're not challenging, then you end up being like them. And it's not to say get rid of your friends, if that's who your friends are, it's just to say make sure that you also hang out with people who are inspiring, open-minded, uh, are, are people who will want you to be a bigger and better person. And um, I think if there was a third thing, it might be about actually having a, a vision to want to do something, to make a mark in this world. Because th there's a, a, a quote that I use from a Tom Waits song. It's, it's a very, um, it, it sounds as if it, I'm, I'm about to preach to you when I tell you the title of the song is Jesus Gonna Be Here. But it's, it's, <laughs> the song's not, not like that. Um, but he's got this line in it that I use to try and sort of measure, will I do this or not? And the line is, I want to make this place better than the way I found it was. And I think that if we all had that kind of mantra, that kind of approach, then everyone's existence in this planet would make the planet better. And I think that's a beautiful thing for us all to aim for. And that'd be nice for your uh, digital, exactly. digital budget. Exactly. Although my favourite Tom, <laughs> Tom Waits line is, is slightly less ambitious and it's fishing for a good time starts with throwing in your line. Which is, <laughs> which is, uh, which is a great excuse to have a drink. I don't 
Small and change called Rain Dawn. <laughs> 38. Do you remember that one? Yeah. Um, so Diamonds on the windshield of my car. Right? <laughs> that marvellous voice. Yeah. I'm going to have to uh, pay royalties now. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Um, so, just at the end of the, the end of the getting to know you round, um, uh, if you were advising a bright young grad who's smart and driven and wanted to get into digital marketing, what would be your advice? I guess with anything that you want to get into, you need to learn the rules first, and once you learn the rules, you can break them. And it's the one thing where I remember when people were talking about how, oh, this is the year, it's about five years ago, wasn't it? This is the year that, that uh, millennials are going to be hitting the, the, the workplace. This is the year that the people who've grown up only ever knowing the internet are going to hit the workplace. This is going to make a massive difference. No, it didn't make any difference whatsoever. Because people, when they come into a workplace, they have to understand how things work. They don't come in and instantly revolutionise. Well, I don't know. I was just thinking... Uh, I was lucky enough to meet uh, three people in Northern Ireland who um, started a design company that became a very successful agency, actually. And um, on their last day of college, they sat in the refectory drinking coffee and said, have you got a job now? What are you thinking of doing? And they decided that they would start a design consultancy. And because they started not knowing what design consultancies did and how they did it, they created their own rules. And so in many ways, I mean, mm. they became very successful, totally by accident, we would say. But So I, I really admired them for doing that. And again, there's no substitute for doing. I mean, one of the awful things is that when you do go and start, if you start in the wrong place... You suddenly discover after a couple of years you've got to unlearn a whole load mm. of things. Um, and again, for me, uh, the analogy is that the marketing is fragmenting like crazy. Advertising is fragmenting. What I would say is every single one of those fragments is an opportunity. And so I've seen really young people come into the business and then go off very, very rapidly to set up their own companies. Do you remember there was... Um, uh, a young couple made a, a young uh, creative team made a film. They shot a film for Volkswagen, and the line for Volkswagen Polo at the time was uh, small but uh, remarkably mm. strong. And um, it was a terrorist who blows himself up. In, yes. And the Polo is so strong that actually he blows himself up inside the car, but mm. nobody else. Volkswagen went absolutely apeshit. They tried to track mm. him down. They took Is out that injunctions. Fred Farid or something? It's one of his anyway, yeah. as a result of it, they got offered a job in an ad agency. And after six months, they discovered it was just dull, terminally dull, like <laughs> your anecdote mm. earlier, Dave. And so then they started up their own viral company and pretty soon were making really interesting, very different films to anything they would do. So my advice to young people is, listen, do it. You know, the technology is in your hands, your mobile phone. Mm. Now, Will I Am told me that uh, when they were, uh, he was in the studio with the Black Eyed Peas, and there'd been six months argle bargle about how they were going to advertise the new album. Um, and what he did is he pulled out his mobile phone, he, fo he filmed the band uh, while they were in the studio doing stuff and saying stuff to camera. He edited it on his phone. From his phone, he then just posted it up to YouTube. You know, and 16 million views later, uh, what he's able to say is he circumvented the whole thing just by doing, doing. Mm. So, but mm. I, See, I, I hear that, and I think that that's interesting, but Will I Am was Will I Am. But right. And his record label had invested massively in media to make him that person. I'm not saying he's not interesting. He's <coughs> no, an interesting the, guy. But so he's, he's just standing on the shoulder of someone else's investment. Loads of people's investment to be able to do that thing. Whereas if we were a little folk group and I videoed it and put it on YouTube, what well, three yeah, people would no, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that uh, if you go back to when I first started out in advertising, if I wanted to make a film, mm -hmm. even if I wanted to make a commercial, I was going to have to rent a camera, I did need the yeah. lights, I needed the studios, I needed to understand how film worked, I needed all of the apparatus. But today, the technology allows you to have ideas and to make them and then to share them with anybody. And when I say ideas, they don't just have to be 
if you like, messages that we put out there to people, but actually ideas that become apps, ideas mm. that about how customer yeah. service can be improved, ideas about how, how to set up a virtual business. I, any idea you have now, you, know, you can... Pyramidia started um, eBay with $40. Mm. So, I mean... Why not? Yeah, when I when I started in the industry, it was before the the internet was a thing, and that meant that uh, I was doing radio, uh, TV, um, cinema, poster, and in Scotland because you kind of did everything direct mail, and that to me it was amazing. It was the only way that I got to play with media like that. Imagine that you're you're in your early twenties, and you want to play with media, and here you go, you've got a job, and this job means that at least once a week I'm in a recording studio recording ads that I have written with actors. Jeepers, that, that's unbelievable. That um, most weeks I would be filming TV ads that would then be on air, and I'd be able to see them on the television. Again, absolutely incredible. And I learned from that, and, and it was through the doing. Now, these days, I've got more power um, in GarageBand on my Mac for free than I had in a recording studio I used to work in that had one of the old desks out of Abbey Road and a couple of big reel-to-reel -reel machines and stacks of ev uh, effects. And, and this thing that would have cost probably over a million to outfit, now I can do for free and even more on my Mac. Now, we are in a, a stage now that the only thing that will uh, differentiate you from anyone else is the doing. Because I used to find that, that people would come to me with portfolios, and I look through the portfolio, you've got the, the cost of entry is a good portfolio, some good ideas. But the thing that differentiated these people, I wanted to see people who were completers. I wanted to see people who were doers. Because doing, that tenacity to finish something off is the rarest of all skills. I... Um I used to, when I ran a creative department, we used to write a lot of TV scripts, and I got really excited when the camcorder and the video revolution turned up because I figured that now people could uh, write ads, shoot them, and test them, and see whether they worked or not. And of course, people would bring their scripts to me and go, oh no, well, you know, I thought I'd take this to whoever the in director is and see what he thinks. And I thought, what a cop out, until Mark Chalmers wrote a couple of scripts for Ariel, fabric conditioner, and then hired a camera over the weekend and went off to Southall and blew my mind. You know, because um, what he did is he filmed uh, a couple of Indian families talking about their laundry, and of course, the colours, mm. absolutely. And he found this long shot looking down back uh, over all the back gardens of Southall with all of these clotheslines, with these incredible, honestly, it was just fantastic. There was a creative guy wanting to make stuff and for me so we're going back 20 years now I mean it was tragic to see that there were so many people in ad agencies insecure enough in their own uh, abilities as makers they were much happier just being thinkers yeah. whereas today going back to what you're saying absolutely you can go all the way through make stuff put it out there so Thank you for your getting to oh, know Oh, by the way, go back if I was... I, I can't understand why more people aren't using YouTube. Be a YouTuber. Start mm. a podcast. There's a girl out there who's got this brilliant YouTube channel, uh, which is about the fact that she hasn't got a job. And so mm. her job is now that she hasn't got a job. Mm. Isn't it brilliant? <laughs> mm. I mean, and I think she's got something like one and a half million followers now because she is living the dream. And what do you... Cause, um, because of working at Google, you'd be massively exposed to YouTube. What, what, what advice would you give to someone setting up a YouTube channel? Given that you're doing it yourself, or starting to on that journey. So, we, you know, the three of us, we're not kind of twenty-one-year-old yoga instructors or people on a gap year or you know, exploding stuff in microwaves or whatever it is, which obviously doesn't cover anywhere near the whole, whole wholeness of what YouTube does. How how does someone in like our, our older generation go about setting up a successful YouTube channel? Well, there's the first thing. Hardly anybody in this so-called older generation uh, has done, and so um, so that's the first thing. I think what you have to be is interesting, mm. and um, so I mean some of those young YouTubers. I mean Dan is not on fire. Is really clever. 
uh, and his videos are beautifully constructed. I mean, it looks like a young guy just talking to camera, uh, but he must have, A, written those things, and secondly, uh, they're great. They're funny and charming and interesting. And Zoella also, I mean, I know she... But what she has is, is, is personality and authenticity. And, um, and so that's what I'd say. You've got to have something to say. You've got to be interesting. And verbal ticks are not good, by the way. Ums and ahs and all the rest of it. I'm going to watch my ums and ahs like a hawk for the rest of this podcast. Cool. So... The last uh, tw- kind of twenty minutes or so, uh, obviously the pod chat, the p- verbal take pod chat. Come on, pod, the pod I chat, like it. The podcast is it's called the shiny new object. So we, I said to the guys, I said, okay, look, what we're we going to talk about? What better new technology or new marketing shiny object? And it was very difficult to get them to agree on anything, which is <laughs> quite interesting <laughs> in its own right. But the, no, we agreed the, with each other. We just don't agree with you, Tom. The, the, <laughs> The absolute caveat that we came up with, or like compromise, I should say, is the human mind, its future, and its relationship to technology. So, Dave, you talked about how people don't think, and I'm assuming that um, that is in some way related to the technology that's available. Um, earlier, we talked about the echo chamber and people taking things for granted. So, what is what is the future of the way that technology will influence the human mind, and what does that mean for people who work in marketing? Uh, ah, there you go. Straight up. Uh, Straight up. <laughs> Five quid to charity for every film. Yeah, take. well, the nice thing about um, starting your own YouTube channel is, of course, you can edit it. And they do um, edit ruthlessly. But one of the really uh, great moments for me working at Google is when I met Ray Kurzweil. And uh, he was talking about AI and the inevitability of the of AI taking over our ability as human beings to think. And the way he expressed it was like this. He said that over the, uh, the course of actually only a, you know, a few million years, the uh, amygdala used to occupy uh, one-eighth of the cerebellum. It's now grown, so it actually occupies seven-eighths of the total brain capacity. So our thinking capacity has increased. And the amygdala uh, is the part of the brain that does what, just to be specific? Um, I thought that the amygdala are, are the sort of little bits underneath the brain that are to do with... Ah. The, there's no, two no, little no, prongs. No, 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 you've, got, you've got your neocortex at the top. Yes, the cortex. Yeah, the amygdala is the monkey brain. Can you, yeah, can you edit like, all of that shit out? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you it's, go, fine, it's fine. <laughs> but, but it's a very what relaxed cr- podcast. OK. What Ray Kurzweil uh, explained is that the cerebral cortex, that's right, um, uh, has increased uh, stupendously over the last couple of million years. So that now seven-eighths, I think he was saying, of the cerebral cortex is now uh, occupied by, I suppose, our abilities to think. So the more we've thought about things from the lizard brain onwards through language, through all the rest of it. So that part of the human brain has now expanded and there is nowhere else for it to go. Already human birth is fraught with danger. And by and large, uh, what we're not seeing is the female of the species increasing uh, in width, hip size. So the human brain will continue to expand, but the only place it can continue to grow is in, in the cloud. And that's how Ray sees AI being absolutely fundamental to the, the future of the human race. Hmm. So what does he mean by that? Does he mean outsourcing some functions to the cloud or we, we don't have to remember anything? Or, and if we're not connected to the internet, we won't be able to remember where we live? Or Well, you've got to bear in mind that Ray's got a brain slightly... Uh, I don't, it's probably about the same size as mine, but it seems to do more stuff than <laughs> mine can do. I guess what he means by that is that individually, let alone collectively, what we're going to be able to do is to uh, is to use technology in order to be able to enhance our thinking so we can think faster, deeper, more penetratively uh, ab- about these issues. Why? Because an awful lot of it is now going to be taken care of in the cloud. I think that... I- 
I mean, Ray's quite a techno utopian and uh, sort of really sort of believes in this in the idea of uh, like singularity university is very much about stepping into a techno utopia that. That, that you know humans won't have to work at some point because the machines are doing everything. I personally don't subscribe to that, um, and I see the flip side of that. Um, not that I'm sort of terribly dystopian, but I, I think there's certain things we have to look out for because technology gives us yin and yang. Every single time we get a development in technology, you get just as much bad as you get good. And one of the things that we're finding with uh, what we're doing with technology is we have outsourced, first of all, memories. We've started outsourcing memories to technology. And the one thing we're finding is what they call the Google effect. If you think something is stored on a device um, or on an internet, you don't recall it. You don't remember it, because what's the point? You can search for it later. And tests have been done to show that this is what we're doing. So you, you search for stuff, you see online, you find it, you don't retain it. Now, that's a problem, because if the idea isn't in your head, you can't use it. So we have a problem there. Another thing that we've got is that we're outsourcing our, uh, our, our own computing processing power to devices. And that means that it's harder now. I, I'm actually quite good at maths, or have been, but I have been using this for my calculator, as he says. That's uh, for the, the audio subtitle there as he pulled out his phone um, um, and tapped on it, pretending it was a calculator. Um, so I've been using my phone as a way of, of doing sums rather than actually doing sums in my head. And I'm, I'm really consciously trying to do more mental arithmetic so that I don't lose those skills. And I think that that's a problem, that we're not using our brains and exercising our brains in the same way. And then the third thing that's just about to happen, thanks to AI, is that we're about to outsource our decision-making to devices because devices will understand here's the, the way that you make decisions, here's how you've been paying your bills, uh, here's how you've uh, been using your electricity, here's how you use your heating. We'll do that for you on your behalf because we turned that into an algorithm uh, because we think that, that this is how you would behave. And it means we don't have to make any of these little decisions. Now, there's the plus side to that, which is that that then gives us more... Um, cognitive freedom to put our minds to things. But the truth is, people are lazy. Every human development has been out of laziness. I mean, there are a load of things that we don't want to think about. I mean, this is why uh, brands have historically been so incredibly valuable to people, because uh, I've used Colgate toothpaste all my life. I don't think about it. I don't mm. want to think about it. Every time I walk into Boots, if I'm thinking about toothpaste, I'm going to go mad pretty soon. So, you know, I read the same newspaper every day. Uh, and that's what I think AI is going to do. There are a whole load of things I don't want to think about because actually they're, they're pretty bloody boring. What I do want to think about uh, are, are things that are altogether more challenging. I want to be able to have more time and room in my brain to be able to have ideas that are going to, going back to what you were talking about before, going to be of some use, of some value. How can I, in my tiny little way, make this place a more beautiful world? I, I, I agree that for people who have got uh, the spark of curiosity and the enthusiasm and, and, and passion to do, I agree that that can be good for them. Um, in, in some ways, again, yin and yang, because the other thing is that if we're not retaining information, then it's hard to come up with ideas if we're whatever, using those bits of information. But the, for the, the majority of people who um, like to put on mental chewing gum while they uh, sit on their um, arse on a settee, are they going to use the extra cognitive capability that they've got, the extra cognitive freedom to do do any more benefit, or is it just going to mean that, mean that their brain won't be used? So my, so my gripe on this is my the daily bit of audience research that I do is getting the training to work from Forest Gate, which is like a 13 minute tube right into Liverpool Street, but it's above ground, so everyone's, mm. everyone's on their internet, on their internet, on their phones. And I just do a, a quick survey, mm. what's everyone doing? Because I'm invariably listening to podcasts, right, that's, that's <laughs> my use of my time. There was one guy I had... You just listen to yourself all day, every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was this guy who had a, a Samsung phone, and in the top two-thirds of the phone, he was playing Candy Crush or some rip-off mm. version or whatever. And at the bottom third of the phone, he was watching something on Netflix. Wow. I mean, I assume it was on Netflix, so I assume it was Candy Crush, but it was definitely a game and a thing, and I thought, 
fucking hell. Like, my, personally, my brain is really at its best in the morning. Like, you know, up mm. to 11 o'clock, that's prime time. That's when all mm. the best stuff happens, generally. And to blow any of that on, like, imagine how much mm. cognitive load that is to play mm. Candy Crush and follow mm. Walking Dead or whatever. And I think that's scary. And you, and you look around at people's phones and you think, you know, you've got this incredible bit of technology with access to a lot of good stuff, uh, whether that's audio or video. And people are just playing moronic games, as, as you call it, like, visual chewing gum. And I think, I think that's really interesting. And is that the curse of technology that, it, you know, you you don't have to work out you don't have to get the A to Z out you just type it in on Google Maps people you know, think you're, they're you're, people you're, you're, my, I know I'll leave the house and the nest will turn off my my heating I don't have to think to do that but people like we're but Google and uh, Amazon are shaving a few minutes off these jobs and I think you're right people are just spending that on mental so, chewing so, so it used to be that uh, we, we, well, we hang, now, hang on a minute <laughs> go back a bit so just go back uh, to what did people do on the train then? Oh yeah. man, Tom, that, second, that's second, so unprofessional. Second, my <laughs> podcast, <laughs> to but, oh. sorry. No, no. Um, so what, so did, what did people used to do? I'm just saying that, that I mean, when you got tube, dead, quick story on the yeah. original tube, you could get breakfast. They had a breakfast carriage on the tube. Nice. Yeah. Imagine that fry oven. Anyway, sorry, Patrick. No. <laughs> You're my guest. I no, I'm talking. Wow. No, I love that idea. I'm just saying that um, uh, it's very easy to look at people as they commute and to talk about the mental mush that they are absorbing. But I figure it was always like that. Even if you're just looking out of the train window, it's mush, you know, because you've got formless thoughts passing through it. Reading your son, or even if it's The Guardian, you're still absorbing a whole load of stuff and then forgetting it. But, but that kind of looking out the window, your, your brain goes into something we call the, the default mode network, um, which is a really valuable thing. That's when we start getting daydreamy kind of things happening. That's, that's the moment that we, we start coming up with ideas. That, that's when we can, we can imagine scenarios and outcomes and we think of how we fit into that and we can empathise with people. Default mode network in, in the brain is, is, is basically the home of creativity. So, so it's that kind of the, the boredom looking out the window bit is when your brain is at its best. As soon as we get into um, doing tasks and we, and we put on the task network, we're all about focus and we switch off the parts where the lovely random stuff that comes from the pecunias at the back here um, hits you. And, and I'm, I'm fascinated with the stuff that we've got just recently. It's only since the early 2000s we've been getting the learning that the, the brain, it's not about individual functional areas, it's about networks. And this whole sort of network approach, I'm a big fan of, of, of this looking out the window and, and drifting off because that to me is when the magic happens. And also in um, the newspapers, whether it's the Sun or the Guardian, there's no, there's no kind of decision architecture in there, or very little. Whereas on a game, the whole point of the game is to keep you within the game, to expose yeah. you to more adverts or to buy more upgrades. And there's a, a decision architecture, probably a better way to mm. call it. So you go on. Like, there's an expression I heard recently, which was. Um, you go, oh, I just need to drop Dave a line. I'll send him a message on Facebook. And then you then you get distracted and you, you're there. And then the, the expression was, you regain consciousness. And you're fine. Mm. I, was, I was supposed to, supposed to send yeah. Dave. And, and, and it made me feel really sad because there's a user experience specialist somewhere in California <laughs> manipulating me. So I, yeah. I want to speak to you specifically about a thing. Yeah. He, his or her job is to distract me from that. It's just so I can make it more ads. Yeah. You lose consciousness. Whereas, flicking through the paper, I mean, you could argue that there's design architecture within a newspaper, but it's nowhere near as powerful. So, I think I'm with Dave. I think staring out the window, thinking about beautiful thoughts. What was the part of the parent? The parent no, is? I'm with Dave as well because I'm <laughs> precarious. I can agree. <laughs> so, I can agree so, more that so, actually it is when the brain is in limbo that it begins to at this slightly subconscious level, come up with mm. extraordinary stuff. So, let's However, leave it there. <laughs> um, got a couple of minutes left I'm just here. feeling really sorry for people on the train because it is dead time. Yeah. And if they want to fill it with Candy Crush or Coronation Street, then 
at the same time. And it's and it's, <laughs> yeah, it's all that right. Is. I, I've got this thing where I, I I believe that the the brain has four modes, and you can you can feed your mind. That's great. You can occupy your mind. Okay, that's Candy Crush, and and that's uh, that's just clicking on the the bit of side boob you spot on on the YouTube bar at the side. Um, then then you've got um, so you, so you've got feeding your mind, occupying your mind. Uh, you've got exercising your mind. That's when you start taking the stuff and you put it into practice, either doing your job or, or practicing something. And then you get resting your mind. And the only one that's the least valuable one there that that sadly is the majority of time, I believe, that the people spend is occupying their mind, which is just basically keeping this meatball busy until you die. Now, that is the least productive out of all of them because resting your mind is massively valuable as, as part to, to help you... Uh, Activate it and, and feed it. I well. think that's brilliant. Well said. I and love that. A great place to finish. Right. <laughs> so I need to thank our hosts, which is uh, the business that I'm sitting with at the minute. It's Platform 360. Right. So thanks to them for this space. Thank you, Platform 360. Um, where can people get in touch with you? We haven't really talked all that much about this shiny new thing, have we? We got completely sidetracked. <laughs> with- I'm happy. Oh, yeah, you're happy. Well, you're happy. Okay. I'm super happy. L- listener, if you're not happy, <laughs> send Tom an email and say, that's bullshit, man. Yeah. We missed out on the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how can people get in touch with you? You mentioned the directory earlier. Yeah, directory, magazine, and resource. Uh, the website is uh, directnewideas.com, and I'm Patrick at directnewideas.com. I've got um, 23 email addresses at last count. Um, let me go run through them. No, <laughs> no you, you can find me. I've got such a ridiculous name that I'm entirely Googleable. Um, so Dave Burse, you'll find me on social media just using, hiding under my own name, and daveburse.com. Um, and hopefully Tom will spell my surname right in the podcast so you'll be able to, to Google me. Um, I will endeavour to do that. Thanks for the vote of confidence. (laughs) Brilliant, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you.